Welcome back to another episode of Seahawks Man to Man. I am your host. I am your host, Christopher Kidd. You can follow me on Twitter at CKIDD206. And I got a special guest with us as usual, but he's actually not here in Seattle. He's in, in Indianapolis where the combine is going on. He has seen things, talked to people. Mike, man, what's going on? You know, day five at the combine, man. Yo, uh, you know, you guys know me, Mike Dugar, the athletic, M I K E D U G A R. Follow me on the tweet machine. Appreciate y'all. We back. Um, yeah, man. Day five at the combine. I feel like a, I feel like a version of that, uh, that Jimmy Butler meme from the finals in the bubble. He's leaned over on the on the railing. He didn't been carrying the heat the whole series. It's just him versus the Lakers, and he is beat. And that is that is how I feel. It's a lot of staying up late, a lot of networking and drinking at mixers and uh, trying to get information and running to this event and that event and talking to this person and that person and going to this media session and this podium and this thing. And that's, you know, it's a, and then waking up and doing stuff every morning too. You don't really sleep in a lot at the combine. I mean, so very busy, very useful though. I learned a lot of stuff, Chris. We got a lot to get into today. You know, we do have a lot to get into. By the sound of your voice, I could tell you were doing a lot of talking and networking. So yes, yes. Uh, applause for Mike, ladies and gentlemen, for getting some information that might help us on this episode right here. Again, if you're a new listener, sorry we took a break. We're working on guests, but you can definitely subscribe on our YouTube channel. And we thank all the love for the podcast via Apple, Spotify, you name it. But without further ado, we do have a lot to get to. And I think the biggest thing we should get to is the fact that the rush story came out. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was it? Tuesday? Friday. Friday. Came wow. out last Friday. Yeah. Wow. So it's been a long time since it's been out, but it feels like it was early this week. So that story came out about Russell Wilson basically saying that Pete and John got to go, which Mike and I had talked about, what, last year, that whole discussion. It's either Pete or Russ. Like we've had discussions about how this would play out. Ultimately, didn't know if it was true or not, but now. But that bombshell, pretty accurate. So what I want to discuss is basically your thoughts on it, Mike. I really believe that Pete and John, they, as you guys see on the headline on the bottom, they took the high road. We talked about it off wax. If someone, one Mike fired, Mike's like, man, y'all, <laughs> F you, man. You, <laughs> yeah. There's no love here, no love. Nah, man, that's not how this rolls. But for Pete and John to just say, it is what it is, man. We've had players have had terrible breakups and an example would be Sherman. For example, it wasn't the best breakup basically cut the man and said, Hey, we're not doing this no more. And then for Sherman to be able to come back to the building, talk to Tariq Woolen, you name it. KJ Wright, another guy that he wanted to be with the Seahawks for another season. That didn't work out. Ended up playing for the Raiders. A couple years later, a year later, he's back in the organization talking to coach Pete being at camp. All of those things. Bobby Wagner. I'm sure you guys just saw the news about Bobby being released. Well, he's going here. He's going to be released officially on March 15th. Yes. But the agreement was, yes, we're, we're moving on from Bobby. Pete at the Combine. I'm sure you've talked to him, Mike. The door is open, per se. All right. And those are just the opportunities that you look at. And then with the whole scenario with Russell Wilson, I'm paraphrasing here, but Pete basically saying, hey, we've had issues with guys before. They come back. <laughs> so I'm not going to close said door. I'm going to be open about it. And I think that just shows how cool Pete is in that situation. I, I use Mike as an example. He was, you know, he kissed my ass. You know, we're not cool like that. Right. Pete, he is, hey, you know what? I get it, upset, whatever the case may be. Just know that if he wants to make up, I'm not going to hold it against him. And John Schneider too, right? Because – Russ was like, hey, both got to go. I know they're a duo, so we, we need to get both of them out of there if I'm going to stay. And that didn't work out, and they were able to trade and get draft picks, which we'll get into. So 
I really applaud those two for taking it and not letting it affect who they are and how they do things as an organization. And I've given a few examples of players that have come back and it's all good. Even Marshawn Lynch seems like it might be just water under the bridge. Yeah, it is. It is for sure. So Mike, what was your reaction? Cause I'm sure you got to talk to Pete and Schneider about it. What is your take on those two and how they handled this entire story dropping and then moving forward? Yeah. I mean, even before like just getting to those two and their reactions to it, you know, when I, when I, I know that people get questionable about, <clears throat> excuse me, anonymous sourcing and things like that. And like, dang, did Russ really do it? Maybe the athletic is lying. Um, you know, Russ tweeted a, a, a denial. That's not really a denial kind of, um, one thing to keep in mind with the athletic, when we report big stuff like that, not just, and to be clear, I was not on this story. Uh, it was Mike, my colleagues, Mike Sando, Jason Jenks, and, um, one of our new and national reporters, a uh, really good reporter named Kalen. Um, when I just to keep in mind with the athletic, we were recently bought by the New York times. Uh, so the standards that the New York times have for sourcing and things like this are very high. So we wouldn't have just run that on like a rumor or hearsay or anything like super second or third hand, we just know that not just for this story, but for a lot of any stories that's got that, whether it's something in the NBA with Shams or something, something on our baseball side or uh, whether we're reporting on like sexual assault or something legal, just know that legal team at the New York times, the boys ain't playing. We can't just run no bullshit up the chain and be like, Hey, can we run this? And they'll be like, no, <laughs> we need, you need this to be more rock solid. Um, look at our reporting on anything with the commanders, pretty much. That's all legal and nasty and dramatic, and we all got to make sure that's solid. So just keep that in mind. I know people, you know, are a little critical of the story in that regard, um, questioning whether Russ actually did it. Trust us. Give us the benefit of the doubt because we have some very high – not to say that, you know, just blindly believe us all the time, but just know with something like this, we got to have it rock solid or the New York Times ain't running that shit. I promise you they would not. We shut that down quick. Um, so uh, that stood out to me just that it really did happen and that we got it solid and we're able to report it. Uh, but the other part, kudos to Jody, man. Jody Allen, the owner of the team, for making that choice. She essentially, and this speaks to what you were saying, Chris, she essentially told chose a culture over a player. You know, Russ said, is it's, it's them or me? Which what you want to do, Jody? And she's like, them. They're the culture and their culture trickles. I don't know. This is not a direct quote of Jody, to be clear. I'm not like reporting that Jody said this, but in effect, Jody said, I'm going to choose the culture. I'm going to choose Pete. I'm going to choose the, the, the environment that helped nurture you to become the player you became that helped the Legion of Boom become what it became that helped so many of our players grow that helped us make the playoffs at that point, nine times in 11 years, I, I think um, was the, uh, time because they made it 10 times since then so we got all these playoff appearances the franchise's only championship some of the greatest players in franchise history um some brotherhoods formed inside the locker room uh you see i don't know if you saw this chris the nfl pa uh they surveyed all the uh, about 1300 of the players in the league and did like scorecards on the quality of each organization travel training staff food um all that stuff i think the seahawks were like 11th or something like that um of 32 and in the, regardless of where they are in their specific rank, the Seahawks, all of the positive ranks they got, that the lowest thing they got was a C for travel because they don't fly first class all the time uh, for the players. Um, all those positive ranks that they got, they're a reflection of Pete. We were talking about the strength staff. Who hires them? Pete. Who picks them? Um, you're talking about the food, making sure that they have, you know, child, child care for the, you know, the players and, it's all the other things, amenities, you know, make sure guys get veteran rest on Thursdays or Wednesdays if they're dealing with something, you know, Gabe Jackson's knee, DK's foot, Dwayne Brown's, I think it was bicep or something, taking care of guys during the week, letting guys get veteran days off during camp, you know, um, easing guys back in, you know, letting them try all these things that are a reflection of John and, and Pete, making sure bridges aren't burned on the way out. Um, they were able to have conversations with Resign and Sherm, like you mentioned. This is after he played for the Niners. They talked to him again about coming back. I think he signed with the Bucks that time. Um, they brought back Marshawn. Yeah, like, you know, Michael Bennett was another breakup that wasn't super great. They cool now. Um, so 
credit to Jody for making that call because that's not an easy call in real time. That's not. Like if, if Russ called her and be like, yo, what's up? You got two options right now, lady. Um, I'm trying to imagine what voice, what accent, Chris, do you think Russ used? When he, when the, he, the serious <laughs> one, no jokes. Hey, look, it's either you want me and we're going to win some championships or you're going to go with John and Pete. And I'm for real. Like you could trade my ass tomorrow. I want to win championships, and they're holding me back. <laughs> what is it, Jody? And then Jody said, "Culture, thank you, though, Russ." Yeah, no, you know what? Uh, even if it wasn't, a, I don't know if it was a call or a text or whatever, or they met in person. I have no idea. But um, imagine if it was like a voice message, you know, like a voice text. <laughs> like I send you guys sometimes. <laughs> yeah, but like with the, but like in the in the in the uh, professional voice that he uses, like. Hey, Jody, it's Russell. Nice talking to you. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is a little bit gone, but um, hey, Jody, it's Russ. Nice talking to you. Blah, blah, blah. Hey, just want to let you know. Blah, blah, and it just like eases into it, you know, like I've loved our relationship, but yeah, like I really like to move forward with, uh, with new leadership. You know, that's not Pete Carroll and John. I love Pete and John. I think that if we want to grow as an organization, we want to get better, we want to, you know, achieve our goal of winning multiple championships, we have to move forward without, you know, those two running the show. And then, you know, go Hawks at the end of the voice message. How um, long do you think that message would have been? Three minutes? That, yeah, it, it would have, it would have been pretty long. Russ, Russ is a rambler um, unless he, like, wrote it down and wanted to, to read it. To, actually, I like that. I like the idea of, like, a voice message maybe, uh, a, a super long, long text <laughs> uh, that just uh, was probably just uh, Jody would probably like, dude, what the what? hell? <laughs> what is this? And get, quit playing on my phone. Uh, yeah, but I have no – I don't know what the – how the specifically the message was laid, but yeah, th I was thinking about that last night. Like, what accent did he use to make <laughs> to make that if he did uh speak to her? But yeah, that's a hard that's a hard call to make in real time, you know, because Russell had been really successful, made nine of the first 10 possible Pro Bowls in his career. Obviously, a champion, gonna be in the Hall of Fame. You look at uh, you know, Tom Brady was able to just bounce and, and go win a championship. Tom Brady proved he could be the system, quote unquote. Russ, she could have thought, hey, you know, maybe Russ could be the system here. We keep the quarterback, keep the roster intact, get some people who's better with drafting in recent years. You know, the, the last draft that John and Pete and those guys had wasn't super great. It was that three man class. This is at the time, that three man class of uh, Stone Forsyth, Trey Brown, and D. Eskridge, yeah. which they're still not getting much production from that entire class. Um, I mean, shoot. Look at the – they only had three picks, but then look at why they only had three picks. So you got to factor in the Jamal trade, a bit, pretty much factor him into that class, and then they didn't have a fifth-round pick because of Gabe Jackson. So you basically look at that draft as Jamal Adams, Gabe Jackson, Trey Brown, D, and Stone Forsyth. That's not a lot. You're not getting a lot um, out of that group. So she could have made the call, keep the quarterback, and she said no. And that that's really impressive because, uh, boy, that would have been a tough – I don't know if that was a tough call for them, but – Good for her. Also, finally getting to what you're talking about, man. Good for Pete and John, who um, John said it was water under the bridge, you know, um, and he spoke to their culture as well. Culture was a real big takeaway from that when I read that story, because basically Russ tried to be the culture in Denver. I think that's probably a good way to put that. And that shit just didn't work. <laughs> it didn't. No, um, they sucked. People got fired. He sucked. <laughs> Yeah, he, he was bad. The offense was bad. Like, he wasn't the only player that was bad. The offense was bad. The Some of the coaches were bad. Some of the coaches didn't get along. Um, not just Nate Hackett. Some other people got, got booted, too. I think one of, like, the O-line coaches or something maybe got fired when Hackett got fired, which was pretty telling when that happened. Um, so, yeah, credit to Pete and John. Um, and it, it, it kind of put in perspective for me, and I mentioned this to some Seahawks people while I've been out here. Pete is old and has seen a lot of shit, you know, and when you're, I think it also speaks to like social media, like me and you were on Twitter and Instagram and stuff a lot. And we, everything feels like you got to react. It's like, Ooh, a big thing happened at the Grammys. Let me react right now. Let's do a podcast on it right now. Will Smith just slapped Chris Rock. Everybody got to react. Um, something just happened. Everybody has to react. Ooh, someone just called somebody out. Juju Smith just called out all the Eagles. Ooh, Eagles got to react right now. And Pete, when you're not in that world of having to just react, to every little thing it does i think help a guy his age who's also just been coaching for 50 fucking years um to just be like give it some time 
step back, you know, look at the whole thing and just take time on it. And John Snyder's like that way too. He's not as old as Pete, he's like 50 something. But that was good to keep in mind too. And that also speaks to why probably why Jody in the organization was able to make that call. It's like, yeah, Russ is good right now. That's one player. Let me step back and look at the totality of the organization from the strength staff to our scouting department, you know, to our front office, to our coaches, to our other players, to our media relations people, whatever. That is probably like when I st- like in the moment, if you say, oh, Pete, Pete and John or the, the nine time Pro Bowl quarterback who's still in his prime. Oh, give me that guy. And you take take, take a step back and you be patient. Like, oh, you know what? No, I'm going to run with the. The, the you know the totality of the organization and they and um, that that was good and I thought that they handled that really well publicly with saying hey it is what it is I'm gonna stay with my guys through the end um we've had good times through bad times it'll all come back around because I believe in the strength of our relationships with all of our players and boy well, I went up there on that podium if I'm Pete Carroll fresh off of winning nine games Fresh off of Rust is getting his other coach fired. And I'd have went up there and be like, huh? Yeah, I guess he couldn't cook, huh? I'd have dropped all the puns. Everything, man. Everything. I'd have been up there being so petty because getting somebody actually to get somebody fired is pretty crazy. That's that's not like super nor like Chris, we and you are both big NBA fans. That happens in the NBA all the time. <laughs> that happens in NBA talk. Like yeah, old, old, old head NBA fans know that. Um, Nate McMillan just got canned, man. <laughs> yeah, he, you know, yeah, beef with Trey Young. I feel like Demarcus Cousins has gotten like a bazillion coaches fired in Sacramento. Uh, I know he's not in the league anymore, but yeah, you know, coaches get, you know, players get coaches fired all the time. You know, it happens in the NFL. You know, I don't know if it happens in baseball or some other sports, but yeah, it happens. And, you know, you got to take it in stride. But, ooh, man, if I was the coach in question, yeah, nah, we got beef, kid. We, I'm, locking, I'm locking that door. LeBron getting David Blatt fired. <laughs> yeah, like, Come on, man. It, it, it does happen. And I, I do think it's, it's more normal than we probably realize as media people, you know. Um, but the, the culture, the culture won out. And the Seahawks aren't like Super Bowl contenders or anything. So it's not like, you know, you know Pete Carroll and John are perfect and the culture is perfect. But they're a lot closer to winning a championship than the Broncos are. Yeah. I, can, I can tell you that. So 100% yeah, facts I, like, there. I like their reaction uh, to that. I thought they handled that really well. Very mature. Um, I think that is another, it speaks to the culture. That Handle it how they handle that is a Pete thing. Like after Pete said what he said, there was no way John could go up there and just flip flip rust the bird at the podium. You know, he follows Pete's lead in that way. It's really powerful. Now we have a lot to get to, man. We could either go Jalen Carter, got Geno Smith updates, the quarterback chatter, the future of Bobby Wagner. Could he be in a Seahawks uniform? What do you think, Mike? I man, I, let's let's go Geno. Geno. That was something I was trying to get a feel for while I was out here. Um, and <clears throat> not going to lie. I didn't get a good feel. Um, <laughs> well, because it's not like a thing. I remember like when I came out here trying to figure out how much Clowney could get paid. That was something that involved a lot more teams. You know, like in theory, you know, I could talk to somebody. I'm going to just throw out a team. Like the Dolphins. I could talk to the Dolphins and be like, hey, what you guys think? How much would you guys give them? Blah, blah, blah. And I can get assessments that are relevant. There's not really much I can ask other people about how things are going with Gino. It's really just Gino's guy and the Seahawks, you know. Um, and I did not run into Gino's guy uh, or anyone from his agency here. Um, maybe I'll That's try surprising. to um, No, a lot of these agents, A, not a lot of them are on social media. So I don't know what half these guys look like sometimes. Um, and then if you Google them, they have pictures online. But a lot of them are like middle-aged white guys. So they're using a picture from a while ago. Like when the agency got started, it's like, okay, well, now they got more wrinkles. Now they got some more gray hair. Everyone dresses the same out here. It's like quarter zips and jeans. And it's it's tough to just like, they're not wearing name tags, right? I remember last night I was at an event and I was looking for Tyler Lockett's agent. It's his agency was throwing the event. And I Googled his agent. I knew who it was, but I just couldn't remember the name. I Googled it. I looked at the picture and I looked at all of the middle-aged white guys in the room. And I was like, fuck, I'm not going to find this guy. Like, it's just, it's so hard. It's just, is that you? They all got the same type of haircut. I'm not just trying to say all white guys look alike, but it is tough. <laughs> like, Google, okay, if you guys pause the show and, and Google Andrew Kessler, you know, athletes first, right? That's Tyler, uh, part of the guys who rep Tyler. 
Now imagine being in a room full of guys who look all like that. It, it, it's it's just tough. It's very tough. And then even like Gino's guys, like a a, a, a bald ish black dude. Uh, I didn't realize how many of the the black agents are bald okay. like that. Yeah, that's just like damn. Y'all yeah, kind of look like too. <laughs> right, and then a lot of it's not a lot of black people who work in the NFL um, at like the coaching level. Uh, most of the, like, the head coaches are white and stuff like that, but like a lot of scouts are black. A lot of black scouts, a lot of black position coaches, and a lot of black agents. And all them guys dress the same too. They usually in like Nike zip ups, you know, jeans and some Nikes, you know, hats. I'm like, damn, man, this is tough. Guys need to wear name tags. So I didn't run into Geno's guy. Um, but I do think what was important about the franchise tag, you, know, you saw that, Chris, that Bob Condota of the Seattle Times asked that question to, Bob, uh, to John Snyder. I was like, John, would you use the franchise tag? John was like, Bob, you're, you're, an, you're a cool dude, but I'm not going to tell you that. Um, and the reason is John, that could be huge in negotiations. If John, let's say, Chris, I'll give you an example. Franchise tag is what is it? Thirty-two million. Yeah, thirty-two mm-hmm. four. Yep. Let's say in theory, John Snatter and, and he's, he's negotiating with Gino's guy or Gino's team, whoever. And they're let's say they're hovering around like twenty-five million or something like that. Let's say Gino's people want like thirty-five. But what if John's coming in around like twenty-five a year? Um, to say, all right, if we can't get this done, man, I'm probably just gonna tag you. If I'm Gino's people, I'm like, oh, so you would be cool with a $32 million salary for my guy then. Huh. If that's the case, that's about $7 million more than you're currently offering. Why don't we just do an av- average annual salary of 32, spread that out over three years, though, like get a three-year deal with at $32 million per. That way we can tweak the cap hits, you know, make it so that instead of having a $32 million cap hit in year one, it's more like a $16 million hit. If you're willing to just do $32 million for our guy, at least for this year, why wouldn't we just do that? You can't do the franchise tag, Seahawks. You got to fix your roster. You don't have that much cap space. So if we can't agree to the deal and you're going to use the franchise tag, well, damn, let's use that number then. And John and uh, Matt Thomas, their other uh, negotiating guy, would probably be like, oh, shit, he's right. We shouldn't have said that. So I think that that's why it was important that John mentioned that. Because the tag is not feasible. How much cap space do these guys have right now, Chris? What is it? Just under thirty million. Let's take yeah, a it's not much. They've already, they signed Nick Ballore, Jason Myers, Phil Haynes. Like it's getting eaten up. It's probably like a twenty-five. Okay, million. my bad. It's uh thirty, a little over thirty-one million. Hold on, where are you seeing that? Um, see. cap Seattle cap table. Uh, let me check over the cap.com real quick. All right. Estimated is at 24.7. Yeah, that sounds okay. That sounds right. So you can't hit you can't hit uh, a $32 million guy. So with Gino. So I thought that was really interesting. And uh, I know I sent you the audio of John's question to uh, John speaking to whether they would take a quarterback, mm-hmm. excuse me, with the fifth pick. Well, you, Chris, you see how uh how dead ass serious John was like, well, why would we take a quarterback? Because they don't they roll they on trees. Oh, that was a great line. <laughs> oh, that was that was that was a great line. I wish I was still in newspapers and somebody did like, you know, they have cartoon illustrations in newspapers. Yep. I wish somebody would do like a cartoon of a bunch of quarterback prospects, like put CJ Stroud and Bryce Young and just draw them growing on a tree. Like mm. draw draw them as leaves. That'd be kind of funny. Illustrated. Like, yeah. That'd be funny. Someone should do that. But yeah, Chris, I don't know how you took that, but I was like, whoa. Yeah, you it's, guys might take a quarterback. The th- So, and even Pete keeps harping on the fact that they're in a different position this year than ever before. They're picking in the top 10, let alone top five for the most part. You have to, you have to seize that opportunity. And if that means, Mike, you always talk about take the best guy on the board that you want. Yeah. Right. Everyone has their boards on what they want, who they want. If you get to the number five pick and your guy is there, you take that guy. If that's a quarterback, you take it. If that's a mm-hmm. defensive player, you take it. If it's an offensive, if it's an offensive lineman, you take it. Hearing Pete say this is an opportunity makes me think, wow, they really could take a quarterback. Yeah. And they really could have a compete where they do bring Geno back. 
but it's a competition. And if the young guy, CJ, whoever it may be, mm-hmm. whoever that guy is, Anders, uh, not Anderson, excuse me, whoever that player is, and they can beat out Gino. They're going like to Anthony Anthony Richardson. Is that your thing? Yeah, Richardson. Yeah. yeah, it could be any of these guys, and that's a little scary because. I thought Gino played okay, and I think there's room for him to get better. Mm-hmm. But I understand what's at stake here. This team has aspirations to be in a Super Bowl. They thought it would be this past season. The Niners shut that down quickly. Now they're looking to build on what they had, and I like Gino. But if they can get lightning in a bottle, you take lightning in a bottle. You, yeah. You're not going to get this again next year. Yeah, you know what? Let's put it in perspective how rare it is for them to be picking this high, right? So this is going to be their 14th draft together, okay? Pete and John with the Seahawks, 14th together. They've had a top 10 pick twice. Twice. (laughs) um, In 13 drafts. In 2010, they had the sixth pick. They took Russell Okun, right? But that that pick was the product of Jim Mora's team being bad. So that wasn't Pete's team that, that played into that draft position, right? So just scratch that. So that's so they only have one. <laughs> the only other time they've had a top 10 pick last year was last year. And I'm talking about the Garrett Wilson pick. Garrett Wilson of the of the Jets, that 10th pick is what the Se- uh, what the Jets got from the Jamal trade. That is where Seattle's original pick fell. Wasn't Charles. Charles Cross was part of the Denver trade. So think about that. That's one time basically that when Pete Carroll coached the team, they end up with a top 10 pick mm. in like 12 tries or something like that that's it and even then it was the 10th pick it was like it was pick two meanwhile the cardinals have picked in the top 10 a bunch the niners have picked in the top 10 a ton in that same span the rams have picked in the top 10 they've had the number one overall pick a couple times in that in that span so uh cardinals too yeah like that one time pete's basically coached his way into the top 10 a top 10 pick one time one and it was pick 10 so i think that that like you, you put that in perspective. That's where Pete's looking at it from. He's like, dog, we don't pick this high ever. And as long as Chris, we can probably agree. As long as Pete's still the coach, they're never just going to have a top five pick. I don't think they'll ever be bad enough yeah, that's to, have, to have a top five pick just naturally. They so only have six wins. wins. <laughs> they're not going to. I don't know if that's. How many games did the Broncos win? Like four? I think they four. won five, right? They won they five, and five, five, five and 12. Five and 12. Pete's not going five and 12. A Pete Carroll coach team is not going five and twelve. So, because if they were, this would have been the year to go five and twelve. So, and they went five and twelve. Yeah. So, I, it is very rare. So, I think that it's fair to to wonder whether Pete Carroll and John Snyder are just saying that publicly so they can entice other teams to trade up and get mm, their pick. That's true. You know, that's probably part of it as well. But I genuinely believe that they see how they've been they've been complaining about not picking very high. For years, John been complaining about that for years because from the Seahawks' view, there's 32 guys who get taken in the first round every year, right? This year it'll be 31 because the Dolphins are stupid, but uh, there's 32 guys every year. That does not mean that every team has 32 first-round grades on guys. The Seahawks might have like 15 or 20 in any given year. I don't know how many they have this year. So if you're only got – let's say you got 19 first-round grades on guys. Well, then if you pick 27 – you already picking a guy you don't even think is a first round pick. Mm. You're picking him because you're on the clock. So, you know, because and nobody will trade back with you. So you got I gotta keep that in mind. So if that's your whole existence, is having pick 27, pick 29, pick 36. If that's all you know, yeah, but when you get pick five, you're like, oh, it's lit. What's up? Let's t- ooh, there's some different dudes up here. Yeah, oh, this is where you gotta get to get a Nick Bosa. Bet. Let's let's find us a Nick Bosa. Oh, the Aaron Donalds of the world get picked up here. Okay, sign us up. Let, let's go. Um, so I think this is where you get a Miles Garrett. <laughs> yeah, like ooh, the Miles Garrett is up here. Okay, I'm locked in. Let's 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 do it. Um, so I do believe John and Pete because that is how they're they're looking at it. If teams hear that and want to trade up, cool. But I believe those guys. I don't think they're just blowing smoke. I mean, look at John. John. John, after Russ led the league, oh no, uh, uh, yeah, John, after Russ led the league in touchdown passes in 2017, Russ led the team in rushing. John was like, that's great. I'm about to fly to Wyoming because I need to see what this Josh Allen kit looks like. 
And I think yeah, he flew to Wyoming um, because he tried to see uh, Josh play against like San Jose State, like during the season, like when the Seahawks were playing the Niners. I forget what it was. Maybe Josh didn't play or something. Something just didn't work out. So he was like, I got to see this kid. So he made multiple efforts to see Josh Allen. Didn't matter how much money Russ was making. Didn't matter how good Russ was. He was like, I need to scout this dude. I don't care that we only have pick. I think they had pick 18 originally in that draft. Um, and even in 2017, Russ was really good in that 2016 season. The 2017 draft came along. He was like, I am flying to Lubbock, Texas. <laughs> there is this kid named Patrick Mahomes I need to look at. All you right. Know? Um, and I think they had picked 26 originally that year. So John is like, I need to look at the top guys every year, even if we have Russ. So he could think the world of Gino, which he does. Boy, if they fall in love with a Will Levis, if they fall in love with an Anthony Richardson, and one of them's on the board at five, I think that's really in play. And I do think that would that would legitimately impact the Gino discussions. You know, that would that could that could get spicy because Chris. There's some good QBs in this draft, man. They could, I could see them liking these guys. Well, let's talk about the QB chatter and what you've heard down there with regards to Bryce Young, with regards to CJ Stroud, Anthony Richardson, and even what? Who am I missing? Will Levis? Yeah, Will Levis is kind of so that's that's one thing that I kind of got confirmed out here is that most teams have that as like a strong top four uh, in any order. So some people who have Stroud. Um, some people who have Bryce, some teams who are not as worried about Bryce being, I think he weighed in at the combine about 200 pounds. He probably ain't 200 pounds. He probably has got that water weight. He's been drinking shakes. He, he probably going to throw at his pro day and be like 185 pounds or whatever. But mm. yeah, that weight's going to fall off. I think uh, that's just my guess. No one like told me that, but so you got him, you got CJ Stroud. A lot of people are like, yo, if you can't get Bryce and you get CJ, that's a win. That's a really accurate kid. Um, if, and Anthony Richardson's that polarizing guy. Uh, teams, I mean, I had I had one coach. Uh, this is not a Seahawks coach. Coach on another team. He was like, yeah, I like that Richardson kid. But boy, by the time everyone does their evaluations, I could see that guy get being a second round pick. You know, just because maybe they think he's more like Malik Willis, you know, who just needs time and wasn't ready. And I was like, hmm. AR is better than Malik, but I hear you. He was just saying how he anticipates Anthony being perceived. Um, so that was an interesting one. But I had I had um, someone else from a different team who was like, he is the most talented guy, and he has the most upside. Like, they were like, yo, you take him, and he and everything pans out as it should, well, you're going to win some Super Bowls, you know? Uh, and I, I, I don't know where the Seahawks fall on that spectrum. They probably have to – meet with these guys a little bit more and watch them throw and watch some more tape. But uh, there's the, the perception of this class is really high. Like there's going to be some movement. I think, I think there's going to be teams trading up to go get these guys. Like if the Seahawks don't want to take someone at five um, and they want to like make people think they are so that the Panthers come up or the Falcons come up or the Raiders trade up or even the Titans trade up uh, who, who has picked 13, the Jets. Yeah. The Jets could trade up. Like I think the way these quarterbacks are perceived, there are some teams who would make those big deals to come up. What did the Niners have to give up to go get Trey Lance? Like three first round picks or something like that. I could see teams loving this class enough to, to do that. Um, and that impacts Seattle too. You know, I think, who would you do? Chris, you're on the clock at five. You taking a quarterback? Mm, do I love Geno? Am I I'm probably taking a defensive player, and we can get into that next. But I, I think Gino, I look at what has been painted before, what's been illustrated. Elite defense, you could have Russell Wilson again, the young guy coming in. As long as he is able to successfully hand the ball off, make certain throws, the defense is going to take care of everything for you. I'm not saying this is going to be a Legion of Boom 2.0, but they have the pieces. They have a Tariq Woolen that can be a shutdown corner next season mm -hmm. they still need to figure out what they want to do on the opposite side but that that's fine i'm okay with what they have right now at corner and at safety with quandre Diggs, a jamal adams hell i like ryan neal ryan neal is someone yeah. you can plug in and he can play that role if anything happens linebackers okay you probably still got to draft someone or bring in a veteran to 
bring to get to where you need to be. And then on the D line, you have to draft someone. You need to get young there. All that being said, still need an offensive lineman because Austin Blythe, he retired. You got to figure out which one to do at center, guard spot, right guard that is. Questions there. But if I'm going to take someone, I'm going to take someone at five. It's got to be someone on the D-line, someone defensively that can change the dynamic of a play like that. We saw two years ago Geno Smith against the Steelers getting sacked by T.J. Watt. I need that type of player when it's crunch time to go in there and make a play. We saw that in the Super Bowl or the divisional game when Aaron Donald makes the game-winning sack to send them to the Super Bowl. I need that type of play from someone. And if I can get that defensively, that could move the Seahawks just a little bit in that division in the NFC West. And then potentially they can come out of the division and represent the NFC in the Super Bowl. That's what I would be looking for. Not saying that I don't believe in any of these young quarterbacks, but I love what I think Geno can be. And we saw a glimpse of it. Did he have a great start through the first seven, eight games? Yes. And did he kind of, taper off yes but there was a lot going on injuries with running backs not sure about the health of the tight end position dk dropping some passes here and there dk catches some of these passes we're having a complete different discussion those passes ended up in losses if i'm not mistaken all that taken into account i think gino is someone that can lead this team actually not lead but he can be a player on this team, that's not the reason they lose. We talk about that a lot. Is he the reason you win or lose? Well, forget that. I just need Gino to be there and not screw it up. I think Gino can do that. He's shown enough, in my opinion, that he can go in. He ain't got to win you a game, but damn it, he going to get you in there. You saw that what he did against Detroit Lions. They're not world beaters or anything, but my goodness. If Gino's not on the team, are they putting up 40-plus points? Is he delivering every single drive? Another quarterback delivering every single drive? That is the distinction I'm okay with in regards to bringing back Geno and drafting a young defensive player. Yeah, I think I would draft the defense too. I just think uh, you can you can. I feel like if you're trying to win in 2023, taking a quarterback with the intention of him sitting in 2023, that's that's arguably a mismanagement of your of being up here. How rare that opportunity is. Like remember when I was rattling off the type of guys the Seahawks have gone against. You know the the elite. It's not just the elite quarterbacks that get taken um, very high up here. It's the it's the pass rushers too, it's the interior rushers too. So I think I think that I'm, I'm with you on that. And and the important part too, I think a lot of people now like the scenario where you draft someone like Will Levis or Anthony Richardson or even C.J. Stroud, and you let him sit behind Geno. I don't think you should do that. I think if you are going to draft a guy, let's say you how about this. You give Gino three years, however many million. His year one base salary is pretty low because you want to finesse the cap hits. Signing bonus is big. It's spread out over three years. So, and then in 2024, let's say that salary becomes fully guaranteed later, like next March. So really you have Gino on just a really expensive ass one-year deal that you spread out the money on. And you take Anthony Richardson at five. You say you take him. And you say, all right, Anthony, you're not going to start this year. It's Gino, then it'll be you. Um, I, w- I wouldn't do that. I-, I-, I, would- I would tell Anthony and Gino, look, we drafted this guy high. We just paid this guy. Put your cleats on, put your helmets on, go throw. Best guy wins. Best guy starts week one. I, I, w- I-, I feel like you have to do it that way. I just don't think you can just take a player this high with how rare it is. Whether you take Levis, to, it doesn't matter. The point is, when you take a guy this high with how rare that opportunity is, I think you have to give him the chance to help you in 2023. I think you have to. If he loses out, Gino smokes him in the competition. Cool. Play Gino then. At least you gave the guy a chance, though. If you just say, hey, you got to sit. No, that's stupid. Give everybody a chance to compete. Oh, man, I'm over here sounding like Pete Carroll now. I talked all that culture stuff. I sound like a coach. Um, but no, that's legit, though. Don't I, I, I don't believe in that. I, don't, uh, I have some other philo- philosophical beliefs about the value of just quarterbacks sitting anyway, but I don't think we need to hash into that or just to dive into that. I just think in general, if you do take a guy, and I talked to some people in the league who kind of agree with me on this one, is that if you are going to take a guy, whether you're the Seahawks or the Lions, 
Um, the Lions are in the very similar boat. Let's say they take Will Levis at, at six. You need to tell Will and Jared Goff, here, here's two foot walls. Go throw, and by August 30th, we'll pick the best guy to lead the, the Detroit Lions in 2023. If that's Jared, that's great. If that's Will Levis, that's great too. You'll play. I just don't think you with those two teams and, and picking this high, I know that the Lions have picked this high before, but when you get that guy, you have to give him a chance to help you in 2023. So I think that's the route you take if you do take a quarterback. I'm with you. Take Jalen Carter if he's there, right? We can get into that maybe right now. But take Tyree Wilson if he's there. Take Jalen if he's there. But whoever you take, if you do take a quarterback, give give him a chance to help you right now because the goal was to win a Super Bowl right now, not in 2024, not in 2025. Win it right now and then go and, and go from there. So, yeah, we can we can jump into some other stuff they can do. Maybe Jalen Jalen Carter at five, maybe he'll be there, but. That that's where I'm at, Chris. I think if you anybody you take at five or six or seven, you trade back, you give him a chance to help you right now. Well, let's get into it. We both agree defense. Look at that, guys. We actually agree on something. Who would have thought? <laughs> Going defense here, Jalen Carter, top defensive prospect, I'd say, could be in some boards the number one prospect. Okay. Yep. Everyone saw the news. That he was he's gonna be charged in a deadly crash that happened what early it happened in January, January I believe January fifteenth yep. he's uh it was two, uh, he's uh he was arrested for he turned himself in so arrested turned himself in and then was released on bond I think I think he's actually already back on his way up to Indianapolis uh, yeah to meet, to meet with teams uh two misdemeanor charges of uh, reckless driving I think and racing um they're tied to those two things I may be getting the specific charges uh, wrong but it's reckless driving it's racing and. Um, yeah, the misdemeanors. So the question then obviously is, is he going to fall down some draft boards? I've, the news just broke the other day. So I haven't had a chance to talk to like every team, but like my homie, Charles McDonald, uh, writes for uh, Yahoo sports. He's a uh, four verts on Twitter. Shout out to Chuck. Um, like he, he wrote a story on Yahoo, you know, where he kind of did talk to some people and I've talked to some people here too. Right now, it doesn't sound like he's falling down a lot of boards. Just right now, that's, the, things could change when he talks to teams, explains it. Because when you lie to the police and you're driving fast, allegedly, you're, dra you're allegedly drag racing or whatever in the middle of the night and someone gets killed and you flee the scene, lie to the police about it. You know, that's I need to ask you about that. Like, I need to know if I'm a team like, hey, man, what's up? Why'd you lie to the police? Why'd you leave if you didn't do anything wrong? You know, blah, blah, blah. So from what I've gathered. And I think um, someone on a team, not the Seahawks, but someone on a team told me, it was like, you know, Mike, it's not even as much as like how bad these charges are. Like two misdemeanors. If, you, if you're a cynical team, just really just focused on him rushing the passer, two misdemeanors ain't going to drop you off the board. That's just kind of is what it is in the NFL. But he was like, we, uh, we just have to make sure that this isn't just like the tip of the iceberg. Like, this isn't just the first of what, it, like, you go dig into him more and you're like, oh, man, we're going to uncover some more shit about this kid. You got to understand and figure out if this is an isolated incident or a trend. And that's probably going to be hard to figure out. But that's that's this this incident, the situation, this arrest that forces teams to do that. Say, oh, man, we already were doing our homework on Jalen, but now we really got to do our homework on this guy and see was this like an outlier, stupid college kid thing or was this just one of the many stupid college kid things that he did. And if once he gets into the league, he may do some more stupid college kids things that eventually hurt our team. That's the calculus they got to make, um, which makes sense. You don't want to just say, oh, you're off our board because of this. It's like, okay, let's, let's dig, let's gather more information. Let's not rush to a judgment. So it's not automatically just, Oh, dang, got arrested. Huh? Ah, well, can't draft that kid. No, 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 no. I haven't heard that. That's the situation at all, particularly with misdemeanors. It's not like he's going to jail. You know, he I think I read that he he turned himself in at like 11.33. He bond how, how quick do you think he bonded out, Chris? Give me a time. Well, I'm already oh, seeing it. I'm already seeing it. Released at 11.49, so <laughs> like not stop. long. 15 minutes? 15, 16 minutes? And what, was his, what was his bond? Like $5,000? Four, four grand. Four grand. Mm. That ain't that big of a bond. Um, so uh, it just got... It sucks to view it that way because there were people did people died 
here, you know? Um, so, to, so to just focus it on just football is a little shitty. I understand that I don't feel good about doing that, but that kind of is the, the nature of the nature of the business. Um, but I think if the, if he does slide to five, I do think depending on what the Seahawks uncover, you know, like I said, digging more, like how likely is he to do something dumb like that while we're paying him? That's basically how you got to look at it. That's how teams are going to look at it. Like, yeah, he did a stupid thing. Is he, is he likely to do another stupid thing while he's on our payroll? That's the calculus you make as the, as a team. And the Seahawks have done that with Jesus Chris. I feel like they've taken a million guys who had problems coming into the draft with Bruce Irvin and Bruce Irvin, like drop out of high school and everything. And like, had some arrests on his on his record before they drafted him. Obviously, Frank Clark's a pretty famous one. You know, you consider the Frank situation that that happened after Ray Rice, and they still took him with their top pick. It just kind of shows you where Seahawks maybe they rely on their research more than what we know that's publicly out there. Who's the other one? There's a couple. Malik oh, McDowell. Malik McDowell. You know. There were character concerns with Malik McDowell coming into the draft, which is why he was available at pick 35. And the Seahawks trusted their research. They trusted their culture. They figured, let's get this guy around some veterans, Michael Bennett, Cliff Averill. And we can, you know, love him up. Backfired. But it just showed, but they still took the they took these guys. So and, and that's there's still more information to be gathered. I think, like, like I said, teams aren't gonna rush to a judgment, but Keep that in mind that teams are not just, yo, guy got arrested off our board. No, not for getting arrested for this. If he was arrested for maybe like, and it was on video that he like stabbed somebody in the throat, I'm like, oh, okay. We can't, we can't, he can't arrest the passer for us if he's in, you know, county jail. You know, that, that, that that's an issue. Um, but I think as long as their research uncovers, um, uncovers the, how likely or unlikely he is to do something like this while he's on the Seahawks payroll or whoever's payroll, the Lions, the Eagles, the Falcons, whoever. Depending on how that research goes, yeah, I think you still take the kid. Is Chris, have you seen some highlights of this, brother? Very talented Ooh. and hate not to be the moral police, but I don't work in that line of field. My yeah. opinion is he was doing something he shouldn't have been. He's young, having fun. Although I'm not making excuses for him. I think at some point in our life, we've all done really stupid things. Whether we get busted or not, that's neither here nor there. If I might even throw in the if scenarios, he got busted for this. It is what it is. To your point, is this something that's going to hold him back? Maybe. If they found out more information, if they look at when he was 17, kind of what you were hinting at, and he did something stupid then, okay, well, that's two times. This time he just got caught. Those are the things that you look at. Right. And if I'm the Seahawks, I'm really wondering, okay, we've had a scenario with Malik McDowell where, hey, guys, now's your time to go kick it before the season starts. You get that little break. Just be smart. And one of your players that you drafted wasn't being smart and ends up seriously hurting himself, misses the whole year. Then the whole money situation, Seahawks are like, yo, pay us back and – it was it, it became a bigger problem. Yeah. To be, to, be, long- to, to be clear on that part, it wasn't that simple as just they said, hey, pay us back. But yeah, that, the, the money part got tricky. But yes, it, Malik- <laughs> it just became yeah. a firestorm. And you don't want that to happen again. And the Seahawks are for sure thinking, yeah, we don't want that scenario. But for all intents and purposes, if, for example, let's say Jalen Carter is snagged by the Cardinals, right? Tyree Wilson is still available. Right. There are still other options. And I think he, I think Tyree is what the second best prospect defensively on the line there in some boards. No, if, I, from what I've gathered, there's a pretty big jump. At least it's perceived to be a pretty yep. big, like there's Will Anderson from Alabama who will be perfect for Seattle. Um, the edge rusher, Will Anderson Jr. And then uh, Jalen Carter would be perfect for Seattle or like half the damn league um, as an interior pass rusher. And then there's a little bit of a, a fall off um, between those guys and the next best defensive players. It could be a Tyree Wilson. It could be miles Murphy. Yeah. Miles Murphy. There's another kid from Clemson as well. You know, the, the, the DB from Alabama, uh, Brian Birch, Br- Brian branch. I think is his name. Uh, Dev- uh, the Witherspoon kid, the corner from Illinois, I think Christian Gonzalez, the corner from Oregon. I've just been kind of gathering that there's a gap. People feel like there's will there's Jalen, 
okay, that's tier one of the non quarterbacks. And then the next tier is those guys I mentioned, Gonzalez, Wilson, blah, 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 blah. So yeah, you can still take Wilson or hell, you could take a corner, but boy, Jalen Carter. I would, I would probably, I would, I would really do my homework yeah. as you hinted at, but I'd probably take the kid and you're crossing your fingers and hoping this was just the one time dumb mistake, having fun, cost someone their life, but you can move on from it and become a better person because that's, that. you get second chances for a reason. Yeah. So make sure that the second chance you get, you take that opportunity and you make something of it. Yeah. All right. And if he can do that, I'm not saying, you know, you forgive and for, you forget, but I think you understand and you just move forward and you try to be there for the kid when things get tough. Cause the NFL ain't easy. There's going to be times where they're going to be rough patches and you're just going to need someone. And the Seahawks will be a perfect organization to try to help with that. Not saying they can heal all wounds, but the culture, as we talked about earlier on the show, I think that is something some of these guys need sometimes. And maybe that's what Malik McDowell needed. It just didn't work out, right? And Pete and John are big on taking guys that have a murky past, I want to say. Just maybe some issues here and there. Not saying that they can fix them, but they think the culture and being around some of these veterans. I mean, now you look at the team. The vet thing is kind of like, huh, so who are the veterans, Chris? They, but they still got vets. That, yeah, they still got guys. Al Woods. Al Woods, I was going to say, yeah. They still have guys that – Hey man, this is the right way. The Seahawks way this is how we do things. We're open book, et cetera, et cetera. And bringing in a guy in Jalen Carter. Okay, I see what we're doing here. Let's go to work. Let's put what I did in the past and let's move forward from it and make me a better human being as well. And I think the Seahawks, that is the game plan if they in fact do draft Jalen because he's a monster on the field. And I think the Seahawks would definitely benefit from having him. Oh yeah, and. And I don't want to make it seem like the, the Seahawks are a, are a you know after school program building up guys out of, out of the goodness of their heart. They would do that because he can rush the passer. You know, it's, it's you it's know pretty straightforward. Yeah, it's, it's it's he can do other things too. But like, it's a cynical view of the situation. You know, you you look at the guy and you're like, hey man, what kind of decision maker is he? Pretty much, that's what you're you're, you're assessing a guy's decision making. Did you make a bad decision or do you make bad decisions? There's mm. a difference there. You know. Did I do a stupid thing or do I do stupid things like plural? Like, is it as another stupid thing going to come up? Uh, yeah. And that's, and that's important. Why is it important? Because we think you can rush the passer, buddy. <laughs> we pay need you that. millions to do this. Yeah. And we <laughs> need that. That's how team, it's a business. It's saying, yeah, you know, like you said, you know, the, you know, the morality police, this, the NFL ain't no after school special. It's a business. And they, mm-hmm. teams are trying to win. And as yeah. long as you're not in jail, they'll give you, they'll, you know, I'll give you a shot. I mean, although we're gonna see at one of these points in the in the in the future of this game where a dude is on like house arrest, like dude from the Lakers was a few years ago, and he can only play in home games or something like that. Some NFL that's gonna happen for an NFL team. I can I can feel that. I, th- I forget. I think it was Contavious Caldwell Pope. I want to say got like a DUI. And yeah, that, it was it was it was KCP. That was yeah, wild. KCP was on. Yeah, it got a DUI. I think it what it was. Um, and it was on house arrest. Could only play home games for the Lakers. I think insane. <laughs> yeah, that that's that's that. Come on, like what? What are we doing here? What are we doing here? <laughs> Trying to win basketball games. So yeah. it's the same. It's the same thing. You know, these teams aren't doing this at the goodness of their heart. It's risk assessment. You know, uh, and that's every team has to do that. I think the Seahawks will do that. And if they feel comfortable, I think. If this is the worst of it, just what we know now is the worst of the situation with Jalen, I think they take him still. I think they take him, and he immediately makes them worlds, worlds better. So That's two wins right there for you, baby. No, nah, that kid that kid is good, man. He is good. He, he, he's everything they need. He can stop the run. He could you know, take on double teams. He can win a pass rush situations. He's strong, um, super athletic. No, nah, it's – it, it, it's crazy. I've talked to some people about him. Like you mentioned, some people have him the highest prospect on their board, you know, number one guy. And if he gets the sliding, a lot of teams would, would, wouldn't would blink to turn that card in. Like <laughs> if he falls all the way to like, like Atlanta at eight board of Falcons, well, they will call Roger Goodell. So goddamn fast to say Jalen Carter name, boy. Oh man. So that's just the nature of the game. So yeah, from yeah. what I've heard, 
he's still he's still high on a lot of teams' boards. And if they find out more, you know, when he does interviews with them, then he may fall. But right now, I, I haven't heard anything to suggest that he's going to fall. Well, things are falling apart for our NFC West rival, and that would be the Rams. And Jordan Rodriguez, last Thursday, she reported that Bobby Wagner and the Rams are mutually parting ways per sources. Wagner met with, met with the Rams that Thursday. And as you guys now know, Bobby is going to be released on, in, in mid-March, March 15th, when that becomes official. And the biggest question is, damn, well, with Jordan Brooks' ACL injury, he probably will not be ready for week one of the season. Cody Barton's future. What to do at that linebacker spot? Do the Seahawks try and get Bobby Wagner? Is that a possibility? Is Bobby looking for a different opportunity? Because we know Bobby wants to win another Super Bowl. That's what he's been all about, winning Super Bowls. Mike, could Bobby Wagner be back with the Seattle Seahawks come 2023? Yeah, I think it's on the table for sure. The Seahawks really don't really rule a lot of stuff out, at least, you know, have a conversation about it. I mean, they just bring guys back so often. They, they brought Marshawn back. They were going to, you know, they tried, you know, they attempted at least to have conversations about bringing Sharon back, brought Bruce Irvin back, brought Byron Maxwell back. Deshaun Shedd, Luke Wilson, um, Brandon Browner. This is all these guys that play for the Seahawks, you know, and and, and came back um, at, at some point, even when they got paid somewhere else or whatever. I think the only one mainly, I don't know if they considered ever was Earl. I'm not sure they uh, considered that after Earl was cut by the Ravens. I don't know that one. But for the most part, they have a long list of guys they've at least considered uh, bring, bringing back. So, yeah, it's always on the table for that KJ Wright too. I don't think they were big on that one uh, after he played for the Raiders. I think that's why he just retired, but they, the, the door is, the door is open there. So I would be surprised if they brought him back. I could see Pete maybe wanting to consider it because remember Pete didn't want to come the first time. Pete was like, John, come on, man. Is there anything we can do? Can we do it? Can we do it? Can we keep this guy? Come on, lower the cap hit something. Move some stuff around. John was like, no. I know you love him. No. <laughs> and they cut him. Um, now, that was after the 2021 season. Bobby's a year older. He played well for the Rams uh, last year. Played really well, particularly in the two games against Seattle. Played great. Um, but I don't see if John had that stance back then. I don't know how he would flip that stance later. I would just be surprised. Um, if you already got him because to your point, he played well. Y yes, is that enough yeah. though? I see that's where I think you're right. That's a, that's a good point. He did play, I think he played just as good as in 2022 as he did in 2021. But if if John came out of the 2021 season thinking this is an older, slower linebacker, well, I don't think he's going to come out of the 2022 season thinking he's any younger or any faster, you know. So I think. I think that's working against uh, Bobby. I'm sure they can have a conversation about it, but I, I would just be surprised. Not to say it just won't happen. I would be surprised. I, I would I would anticipate Pete trying it. Like, hey, Johnny, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think about, you think about Wags? You know, you know, you know uh, how Pete get excited about his guys. You know, like I can I can see John looking uh, doing one of them things where you like uh, you know people who wear glasses. You know, oh, thanks. Push him push him down and be like, look, man. No. We got we got free agents. There's a lot of young guys in this draft. We can we can do it. Um, it is interesting that they have a little bit more urgency at the position, though. Jordan Brooks blowing his knee out um, changes everything. It's particularly when he blew his knee out. I think it was week 17. That's really late in the year. He could miss the whole year. I mean, look at somebody like uh, Odell Beckham blew his knee out. I think what in February? Super Bowl, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. And he still wasn't ready to go by the next January. So will Jordan be like that too? Uh, who knows? And then you got Cody's just a free agent. So right now, neither one of your starting linebackers are in position to be starting for you week one. That's pretty rough. You know, I mean, we saw Bobby last year, Chris. What, what, what do you think? You think I bring him? You think, what would you do? What would you do? Let's no, actually know. You're Pete Carroll. I'm John Snyder. Convince me what you got. The way he played against us, he might have got slower, but we didn't see it. He didn't show, yeah, Bobby lost a step. It wasn't Bobby's fault that they lost that game. 
Bobby did everything he needed, everything he could at his position. He manned that defense. You got to bring him back. Look at our depth at linebacker. Jordan Brooks, probably not going to be ready this season. Cody Barton, free agent. Do you want to bring him back? Let's figure that out. Bobby Wagner is available. Let's come to a mutual agreement on money and get him back in our, in our, on our team because I think he can make this defense better. He's the leader. He knows the system. Yeah, he might not be getting younger, but that's not going to slow down his play. And again, those two games we played up against him, we saw that. And if we go and watch the tape, I think the tape will tell us that, yeah, he's a year older, but nothing changed game-wise from him. And I think that is the big standing point is Bobby was still doing Bobby things at a year older. What? Wasn't he? How, well, how close were he in leading, league in tackles? Was he not second in the league in leading in tackles? Uh, when? This last year? Yeah, I know he was up there. I know he led the team. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I can, I can, I can. Okay, Pete, I will check for you while you're, while you're talking. Keep going. But I think that has to be a consideration. We have to at least talk to the man, engage the interest and see how much it's going to cost to see if we can bring him back. There are other free agents out there or guys that we can go after 49ers linebacker. What's his name again, Mike? Uh, Aziz or something like that. That would be option number one. And then number two has got to be Bobby. We got to talk to him. I think if we can have Aziz and Bobby, I can live with that. So, all right. That's a good spiel, Pete. All right, I got a question for you. You mentioned him. You mentioned that he's a leader, right? Okay, well, we've already kind of passed off the leadership. You know, we've kind of given it to Quandre. We gave it to Tyler. We've given it to Al Woods. As you um, always say, you can never have too many leaders. But what do we what do we do now? Do we shift the leadership back to Bobby? Do we do we, we make don't him- shift it back? We let Bobby come in and be Bobby. It's that simple. Bobby comes in, he's Bobby. Bobby's going to come in. I'm not taking over the team. I'm here to make this team football team better at linebacker and overall. However I can help, you know I got I got you guys. I'm not here to take leadership from Quandre, none of these other guys. I'm just here to play ball, to get us an opportunity to win a Super Bowl. Best part is I'm back home. Let's go after it. Here's the other thing I got for you then, Pete. We saw Bobby a lot of the time last year. Remember, I'm John Snyder here. We saw him a lot of the time last year playing for the, the the Rams. We saw him, we saw him coming downhill a lot. He was blitzing. He was covering running backs in the flats and things like that. Um, he was rushing the passer, you know, short routes o- over the middle and stuff. Well, what if I want to? What if I want to just have him do that on early downs? It, it, what if I want him to just be a guy that's uh, plays first and second down, but he comes off the field? You, uh, what do you think, Pete? You think he's going to be willing to do that at this point in his career? Well, that's why we bring him in and we have the discussion and we can come to an agreement. We can see where he's at with that and then we can try to meet him in the middle. Because if he's going to be the Bobby we saw with the Rams, to be honest, John, I don't see why we do that in the first place. We just play him. Play him 90% of the snaps. Let him do his job. Let him do his thing. Now, if we can come to an agreement where we do have him on early downs, first and second, and he's cool with that, that's fine too. But I think we at least have to chat with him, gauge his interest, gauge how much we can pay him, meet him in the middle, and go from there. All right. I could I could see this conversation with them going something like that. I could see it going something like that. We got to talk money and who's a free agent. There's a lot of free agent linebackers. I think at The Athletic, we have like we're doing a top 51. Uh, I'm no longer John Snyder, by the way. Uh, <laughs> He's back. <laughs> yeah, I'm back. Uh, we have uh, at The Athletic, we have like a top 150 free agent list. Um, I think it's compiled by multiple people. Usually it was done by Shil Kapadia, but I think it's done by multiple people now. And in there, I think we have like 15 to 20 inside linebackers. So there's some options there. Uh, the draft has a lot of good inside linebackers, according to people who know this a little better than me. They got they got the homie Dayon Henley from Wazoo, that kid from uh, Iowa, Jack Campbell. You got uh, he was a kid from Clemson, uh, two can't remember his name right now, maybe something Simpson. Kid from Arkansas, Drew Sanders, I think is his name. I've missed some guys later in the draft, too. There's a kid from Texas. I think his last name's like Overshone or something like that. Uh, he's got a weird last name. Unique. I don't want to call his name weird. But uh, you got him. You got a kid from Indiana, Pace. Uh, so this will, they could go. They could get a veteran and a young guy and pa- uh, pair them with like a Tanner Muse uh, and John Radigan. You know you got Jordan coming back, and then let that you know roll without Bobby. So we'll see. 
I hope they have that conversation about it. Uh, I don't know how it'll go, but they can have the conversation. They can have the conversation. I think they would probably, it'll go a lot like what we just said. And in terms of like asking Bobby where he feels he's at as a player and how much that matches up with how they view Bobby as a player. Cause that's important. Those, 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 those two things don't always match. Um, especially when you get guys at the, the tail end of their careers, they got to be different. You can't be this. It's like asking a corner to play safety later in his career. It's like, bro, you're not that fast no more. You got to play safety. Is that guy willing to do that? You know, so some corners aren't, some corners are. I think, yeah, they got to have that conversation. Like Again, I would be surprised if they, if they got it done, but I think it would take some convincing like you did in that Pete scenario. I think it would take something like that. But I do believe that right now, it's a Thursday, whatever, it's on the table. Well, that is good news. I'm sure Seahawks fans will be delighted if Bobby does return, but that will wrap up the show. We covered Pete and John taking the high road. QB chatter, Geno Smith update. Should the Seahawks even take Jalen Carter? And, of course, we had to wrap things up with our guy, Bobby Wagner, because the Rams and him have agreed to mutually part ways, and on March 15th, he will be a free agent. And who knows? Could he be in a Seahawks uniform? Maybe. Could he land somewhere else? Absolutely. We will find out. Mike, thanks for taking the time to rock with us, man. I know you are struggling right now, man. No, I'm all right. I just I ran out of um, cough just- box. Yeah, <laughs> they got some down in the lobby. I'm I'm still in my hotel. Uh, I fly back Thursday night, so uh, I'm all right. I've, I've been wanting to. I've learned so much about a lot of different subjects. Um, I hope that that came through. Talking just now, I can't really. I obviously can't name who tells me what or whatever where it came from. But just, I feel like our listeners can know. Like, hey, if Mike says something, like I pretty, I feel like on this show we have a pretty good track record of speaking. Like when we say stuff, it ends up being pretty accurate. You know, ages pretty well in terms of like when I you know, say what I'm hearing or whatever, like finally, I hope that people can understand how much we were talking about, like the rush stuff and what was going on behind the scenes. And cause you know, Chris, some people thought we was blowing smoke, you know, even in 2020 and in 2021, I'm over here saying that the, this dynasty, this reign, this, this, this era of the Russell Wilson and Pete Carroll thing is dead. And then Pete or Russell will go up there and say, he wants to win five more Super Bowls in Seattle. And it looks like I'm a fucking liar. Uh, <laughs> no, trust me. I was, I was right. I was right the whole time. Uh, got good insight on that. Shoot, even a smaller one. Like some people were telling me they were surprised by Austin Blath retiring. I was like, for what? I wrote that he was retired. I said on the show that he told me he was going to retire if he didn't play for the Seahawks. Like, yeah, it was. It was very clear. The last thing before we get out of here, it was kind of funny though. I asked Pete, "Is before Austin retires?" I said Pete, "Has Austin told you he wants to even keep playing football?" I know he's mentioned retirement. He was like, "Yeah, that's you know he has." Um, uh, I actually have a missed call from him. Um, I got, I got, I got to call him back. Um, but yeah, it, as far as I know, I think he's he, he's expressed he's he's willing to keep playing. And then Austin retired like three hours later, so it was kind of yeah. like, yeah, man, he maybe should take that phone call. But that was just kind of funny. Anyway, salute to Austin. They got to draft a center now. But just know on this show, if I tell you I'm hearing something the way we word it, give us the benefit of the doubt, baby. Trust Mike. Just yeah, Mike, Mike is a good source now, though. Y'all know, pay attention. He's doing his thing. So keep keep up the hard work, Mike. We appreciate it for our listeners. Hell, ain't even for me, man. You know, I get some little tidbits myself, but that's neither here nor there. We want to thank you guys for rocking with us on another episode of Seahawks Man to Man. Be sure to subscribe if you're a new listener here. We'll be back with more. It's getting busy. Draft coming up. We're trying to get some, some guests on, some Seahawks players. Nick Ballore, stop playing with us, man. Oh, yeah. No, I haven't listened to him on the Pedestrian Podcast. They sent me to – there was like, Chris, man, we got, we got him twice now. I'm like, look, man, at this point, we <laughs> – yeah. After, the, after Russ got traded, you know, I, I see why Nick blew us off. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's cool. We'll get some guys on. We'll get some draft guys on here too. Like the Combine is usually where I meet people that end up coming on the show to do draft stuff. You know, Danny Kelly at The Ringer, Jordan Reed at ESPN. Yep. Um, Doug Farrar, all the pe- draft people, Dane, Dane Brugler at The Athletic. I usually lock in with those people here, and then they come on the show after. So we'll get a lot of those guys to talk draft and stuff like that. Deontay Lee at The Athletic, he, we came on last year, talked uh, DBs with us. Uh, he's going to come back on again. I think probably talk linebackers this time um, because of what we talked about. And Deontay played linebacker at Sac State too. So, um, yeah, it's gonna be, we, we're going to have some people. You, I just got to lock them in to combine it. It's a big networking event. That's why I lost my voice. Ramping it up, baby. Yeah. Can you believe it? We're almost we're, to the draft. We're going we're gonna to take care of you guys um, as well. But, yeah, Nick Ballard, man. Come on, baby. <laughs> Good plan. But yeah. On that note, we will catch you guys later. Enjoy the rest of the week. Mike, anything you want to add? Uh, love you guys. Appreciate the love and support, man. Uh, we'll catch you guys next episode. Peace. <laughs>